Uh, I'm Darcy Dumont, Chair of the Town Services and Outreach Committee. Seeing that there's a quorum in attendance, I'm calling the March 25th, 2021 meeting of the Town Service and Outreach Committee to order at 5.03. Um, uh, Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law allows us to hold this virtual meeting of the Town Services and Outreach Committee. I'm going to call on each committee member by name to confirm that you can hear me and we can hear you. Alyssa Brewer. Present. Uh, you can hear me. Evan Ross. Present. George Ryan. Present. Andy Steinberg. Present. And Paul is here and Guilford. Um, so uh, those assisting the meeting will be monitoring committee members' connections and if necessary, we'll pause the meeting until we're reconnected. Um, we request that everyone be patient with the process. This Zoom meeting will be posted on the Town of Amherst YouTube channel. Um, looks like there is no public present at the moment. So we will skip over this um, comment. Um, Actually, I am a public attendee who happened to have been put in as a panelist, but I am attending oh, well. as a public person. But it just doesn't oh, count okay. that I am there. So I'm going to turn off my camera and mute myself, but I'm here because I'm interested. Okay. okay. So Dorothy, um, if you are an attendee, um, did you want to make public comment? No, no, I'm just really interested in what you're talking about. Oh, okay. All right. Fine. Um, Darcy, do you want me to have Dorothy become an attendee instead of a panelist? Uh, no, no. Okay. Um, yes, no, I just was a little confused there. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so action items moving on. I'm, I'm hoping that we can, because we have a public forum at six o'clock tonight, I'm hoping that we can get through the agenda items uh, by five minutes before the hour, so that we'll have five minutes to switch over to the other meeting, which is a different Zoom link. Um, so let, let's keep that in mind. Um, the town manager doesn't have any appointments tonight. Uh, item four is the town manager report, updates and counselor questions. Do we have any uh, questions um, from the counselors for the town manager. Looks like not. Um, and Paul, do you have any updates for us? No, not since Monday, no. Okay. Um, all right, so we have one item on our presentation and discussion. Item number five, uh, the town-wide residential parking issue, which um, George has taken the lead on, George Ryan, and um, and Guilford's going to provide a presentation. Do you want to say anything now, George? Well, just quickly that um, this has been ongoing for quite some time. It started with the Lincoln Avenue issue, and Dorothy and I eventually made presentations to TSO. Uh, there were two of them, and at the second one, it was pretty much agreed that uh, we would reach out to Guilford and pursue the question of uh, parking policy in town. And we spoke to Guilford on a number of occasions and he took it um, as a chance and he can speak for himself and he will in a moment, but my sense was he took it as an opportunity to sort of review the sort of do it kind of town-wide review of parking policy and see if he could make it more consistent. Um, and so he then produced a memo, which I think he's going to show you and talk about. Um, and then the, the thought was that would eventually come back to uh, TSO, which is today. And uh, I guess we'll decide maybe later this afternoon what, if anything, we want to do. But um, so I'm going to turn it over to Guilford. Do you want me to show you show the memo on the screen? If you wish, I think everyone has it in their packet. I don't. The committee members could could speak up if they wish to see it. Um, I think that would be a good idea so the public could see it. Okay. Okay, so this is um, 
so uh, when we're talking about this, we've always, in the DPW, we've always trying to convince, convince people to look at um, a couple of things when we talk about parking. Um, the three things we talk about are what type of road is it and what's the road's purpose, which we call road classification. Um, how much pavement there's actually available, how much space we can put things on, and then basically how much traffic flows up and down the road. Um, <clears throat> we do want roads to be complete streets, but and we realize in complete streets that some roads um, are not going to be set up the same way as other roads because they do have less traffic and they're in smaller neighborhoods and they shouldn't be big blown, full blown roadways with everything on it because you want complete streets in a small neighborhood. So the way we, I wanted to approach parking is kind of the same way is that, you know, we want to accommodate everything, but we also want to look at what the road is being used for um, to make a decision. So like I said, we, we do have a road classification system in town. You have um, two attached, two other attachments which shows the classifications for all the roads we have right now. Um, we do, um, Use, we use this for the pavement management system because it actually helps us in um, aging a road. We only do a pavement inventory once every five to six years. And between doing in, uh, physical vis visual inventories, we have a algorithm that actually ages the roads and tells us how they deteriorate so we can put them in the right order for repairs. And the algorithm is based on what type of roadway it is. A principal arterial will deteriorate faster than a local road just because the traffic's heavier. Um, so what we, what we propose is we look at the type of road it is. Um, if it's an arterial or collector, we only have parking on those roads. <clears throat> Actually, if it's an arterial, we only have parking on those roads if the road has designated parking spaces for it. And then if it's a collector, we have some leeway in if saying it's a collector or if it has parking or not. And then local roads can pretty much have parking except when the road widths don't allow it. Um, so then the second thing we look at after classification is the pavement widths. And here we kind of said, well, these are the type of pavement widths we want to have. So for an arterial, we want lanes that are either 10 to 12 feet, a collector 10 to 11, and a local road, we don't want to have a lane width any narrower than eight feet, eight to 10 feet. Um, we chose eight, and it's in the memo because uh, Massachusetts, um, the maximum width of a vehicle can be eight and a half feet. Um, so we didn't want to uh, go much smaller because then you really legally couldn't have an eight and a half foot vehicle on the road if it's a one way road. Um, and then we talked about, you know, if, if it's two way traffic, these are your total widths in this third column of this, of this page here. And then we also, added in the bike lanes. When we're talking about these types of roads and the pavement widths, we're going to shoot for this type of width for a bike lane. So if it's an arterial, we're going to shoot for five to six feet, um, collector four to six, and then on a local road, we're going to use the existing pavement where traffic, the traffic volumes lets us use the existing pavement, or we'll go up to a four, four foot bike lane if the traffic increases a lot more. And then we want to keep our parking spaces around 70, seven to eight feet wide, just to make, make it easy for parking and make it, a, make it a accommodate most cars and trucks. So based on those two, the third thing we're going to look at is traffic flow. Um, there's some minor streets in town, local streets in town that there's really, the traffic flow is very light and there's no reason not to restrict, restrict um, parking on it. So if you have enough pavement width, letting people park on the side of the street is fine. Um, if you look at roads like South Pleasant Street, um, traffic flow is very high on South Pleasant Street and it's a main arterial. It has a lot of bicycle traffic, it has a lot of pedestrian traffic, and it has a lot of bus traffic and then vehicles. So those are the roads where you don't really want to have people just pulling off on the side of the road and parking in the shoulder and using the shoulder all the time for a uh, a parking area, you want to have designated parking spaces for them. Um, so we take my our proposal is that we take these three things and we kind of mush them all together and then we can come up with a way of saying these roads we will allow parking on and these roads we won't allow parking parking on. Um, and that's kind of the basis behind it. I have a couple more things to talk about later, but I'll stop here to see if anybody has any questions.
Questions? Don't see any. Am I missing them? No. Okay. Why don't you Why don't you go on then, Guilford? Okay. So if if this if we want to go use this methodology, there's a couple of things we should do said before, and um, a couple of things we think we should do immediately, and there's a couple of things we need to do to verify the data. Like I said, this uh, classification system. And also, if you look at the two pages of road widths, the road widths we use are from the pavement management system. And we tend to overestimate road widths when we're paving because we overestimate the cost. And uh, that way we don't go over budget. We're pretty much on budget all the time. So some of the road widths need to be adjusted to make this uh, system work. And when you look at the two pages, I'll show you the local streets. Um, very small, isn't it? Yeah, can you can you make, make it, it bigger? Here we go. So this, this is this is the list you have in your packet that shows all the local streets. Um, and if you when you go to Wits, even though it says twenty five feet, Allen Street may only be twenty four feet, and it only may be twenty four feet in a couple places. And maybe 25 and one, we just chose this number here. <clears throat> so if you if we want to use this method, what we're proposing as the next steps, I'll go back to the memo. <clears throat> one is we need to verify the classifications we're using. Some people may disagree with us calling Lincoln Avenue a collector street. Some people may disagree with us calling Allen Street a local street. Um, we need to re verify those classifications. Um, we also need to verify the road segments we have. Um, and then we also need to start doing some traffic data collection on some typical roads. So once we determine what the, what we agree are the classifications for the roads, we can kind of go to different road classifications, collect some traffic data and get some baselines to use for determining what's a low volume road, a medium volume and a high volume for Amherst. Um, we could use standard numbers from the ITE, which is International Transportation Engineers, or we can make our own data. And that's something we need to look at too right there. So those three things need to be done. As we, as we do those three things, so we do think there's some things that should be done right away. Um, four, five, and six are things we would recommend we kind of pursue to have done more quickly. Um, there shouldn't be any parking like we, I talked about on arterials. If there's no space, no space is made for parking on arterials, then there should be no parking on it. And those are roads like South Pleasant and Main Street, uh, North Pleasant, East Pleasant. Uh, we want those shoulders opened up for the bicyclist and for transit to be able to use transit for bus, bus stops. Um, we don't want people just parking on the, pulling off and parking on the side of the road. Um, and now that we don't have the snow ban in the winter, we're seeing a lot of people who just park constantly on the side of the road because there's no ban to uh, get them off the road in the winter. Can you make that larger, Guilford? I can. There we go. <clears throat> the other thing we would recommend is that we restrict parking in cul-de-sacs. This also kind of comes out of the, no, the snow ban parking demise. Um, we have a lot of rental properties and cul-de-sacs and what it's causing is um, there's no way for buses, school buses mostly, to go around the cul-de-sac and pick up kids and they sometimes have to back up down the road when they have to pick up a kid. Um, there really shouldn't be any parking in a cul-de-sac. Um, our big trucks have problems, the garbage trucks have problems, even some of the delivery trucks have problems going around cul-de-sacs when people are parked on, on cul-de-sacs. And, and then if we don't agree with that, then that too could be looked at by widths. Some cul-de-sacs may be wide enough, but most of them aren't wide enough because they have islands in the middle. Um, the deal with people with intersection problems, which has come up a lot, is we should just automatically restrict no parking within 30 feet of any roadway intersection. And uh, that will help take care of that little issue. Um, we may have to go and on a case-by-case -case basis look at the sight distance for an individual road and make that 30 feet bigger. Um, but if we just say 30 feet is the blanket, that gives the, 
police department, a number that they can enforce and they can work with as well. And then the only thing this really doesn't address is how to do with driveways. Um, and driveways are a problem. Unless we go out and paint no parking or paint parking spots in front of every driveway or near every driveway, um, we're going to have to come up with a methodology to communicate to people not to block driveways and a methodology that's easy for the police and the parking enforcement to see that yes, the driveway's blocked and yes, we should write a ticket for that person or get that person moved. Um, so these are the next steps I, I foresee if we wanna move forward with this. Um, and I guess I'm kind of at the end now. So any other questions or qu any questions that popped up at all? Yes, uh, Andy. Thank you, Guilford. That was helpful. Uh, there, there's one additional piece that I was thinking about as criteria I was going to ask about. I was, and then there was one factual, just make sure I understand um, the width uh, measurements. But the first piece is um, not all collector streets are the same in that uh, Redgate Lane, for example, has a lot of curves and sideline problems. And Lincoln is straight. Uh, how's that factored in? So uh, we, we can take, we can actually, if we wanted to add a fourth criteria, we can look at geometry and sight distances as well. Um, or we can just look at the amount of speed or traffic volume on the street and just assume, well, if it's a straight street, we can use, the, we're, we're comfortable with this much traffic. If it's a curved road and there's so many curves within a half mile or a quarter mile, we'll use this criteria for too much traffic. Um, so we, we could look at it both ways if we wanted to. Okay, um, I just, it just seemed as I looked at the list of collector streets that that was one. The other thing is that um, I think that I have the, the, know the answer, but I just want to confirm it. I think you said uh, for that kind of street, seven to eight feet for parking lane width and, um, oh, wait a minute, um, going back collector, yeah. That's per side, so if you allow parking on both sides of the street, you'd have to be adding 14 to 16 feet in addition to what you need for other purposes, in, um, like the 20 to 24th street for two-way traffic. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Thank you, Andy. Um, George. Again, Gilford, thank you for this. I, I guess the question is maybe for later for us, but um, I, it's for the committee in a sense, what we think our role is here. Um, certainly we're not gonna get into the specifics. Are we gonna get into what's a collector and what's an arterial? Or my sense originally and still sort of is that we look to Guilford and DPW to sort of establish a policy. And then we employ that policy when we're trying to deal with public ways requests that involve parking, uh, in particular residential parking. So, you know, do we really have or want a role in shaping this policy or are we really just um, looking to Guilford and his folks to shape it and then they present it to us and then um, we then employ it when necessary, when we have to make a decision or recommendation. So I guess it's a question to my colleagues, um, how they see this. Um, Thank you, George. Clissa? Well, now I have another thing to talk about, George. Um, so what I was originally gonna mention, and, and they aren't answers I need tonight, because I know we, we're time limited and this is a great package of information for us to think more about. But um, one is the issue of driveway sight lines and you talked about the painting and we've talked about painting at select board numerous times. We've talked about a couple of times at town council and these kinds of meetings. Amherst just doesn't do that. And so getting a better sense of 
why Amherst doesn't do that, how much more it would cost. We talked about it for both uh, driveways in certain areas, certainly not all of the town, but like Lincoln, for example, and um, also around fire hydrants. And so just so we can tell other people, because, you know, people always come here from somewhere else and are like, well, where I come from, blah, blah, blah. Um, so getting a better understanding of why we just don't do that. But that's one that we can put aside. Um, Another is the cul-de-sacs issue in terms of parking. I totally get in terms of, uh, you know, how things were designed and trucks and buses and et cetera. And that really is concerning. The other thing I will point out though, is like, for example, I'm sure Darcy would say in Orchard Valley, there are some cul-de-sacs where whenever the, you have people over to your house, you know, after you get past two or three people, you, you got to park on the street. And a lot of the street is that cul-de-sac that's around that island. So just trying to get a better understanding of what it means to say no parking like ever on a cul-de-sac or like certain times, or is it very site specific? Because obviously you guys have to wrestle with this sort of thing all the time. And then as to George's question, I don't ever think it's DPW's job to create policy that we then use. I think it's DPW's job to advise us how, what policy to create because they do have the engineering expertise, but it's not a DPW policy in my mind. It's a public way policy that belongs to the town council. It would be a mistake to not have that public way policy be really well informed by the professionals, but it's, there aren't in my world DPW policies on the public way, there's town policies, which are town council policies on the public way. And yes, then we use them for when people have requests. So while we are going to make Guilford do all the work, we're not going to call it a DPW policy. It'll, it's going to be part of the town public way policy. George? Oh, that's, that's helpful, Alyssa. I guess the question then is, do we then, I guess we do, we eventually vote on this um, or give somehow put our stamp of approval on it. And obviously we ask questions and, and we have these kinds of engagements, but your point is that eventually it's in our name, it's our policy. So at some point then does the council vote on this? Is that, that what you envision or? Um... Yeah. That's what I envision, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Well. Yeah, so I agree with that that formulation that it's the council that sets the policy and then the DPW applies the policy to any particular re request that comes in and says how it meets or doesn't meet the policy if there's a if there's a particular issue before the town council. Um, but ultimately it's the council sh who sh should set the overall policy. Um, and then we are the interpreter, we are the implementers of that policy. Alyssa? Yes, Paul, thank you. You said it a lot better than I did. And, and reflecting back to what George mentioned about people coming to us with requests, I know we don't have this magic box place where people put in their requests yet, but as that gets developed, people should be going to DPW for them to say, this is the town council's policy. This is what we can do for you within the confines of that policy. And if people don't like that, then they come to the town council and say, you should have a different policy because now I can never park on a cul-de-sac or whatever. But we shouldn't need to be in the middle of it until after they've already worked with DPW, after we've given DPW clear enough guidance that we're not like second guessing DPW. It's just if something new comes up that we hadn't thought of the way that the person's bringing it up. Thank you. Andy? So I... We have to note that we were actually being encouraged to think about um, another criteria that isn't listed by residents of Lincoln Avenue. And um, that was the nature of the parking on the street. And when I go back and because I used this, these two streets previously, so I'm going to go back to them again. And that's Redgate and Lincoln, which were both listed as collector on that list. Um, Redgate, you might get parking on both sides of the street if somebody is having a party and there's a huge um, uh, attendance that is causing um, a 
particular parking demand, but it's not a daily enterprise that you're gonna see on a street like that. Whereas Lincoln, we heard complaints from neighbors who was a very, of the very different nature because while it's listed as the same type of street on the, on the list, uh, the assertion was that at least when the university is in full session, that people are using it for daytime parking on a regular basis. And that's not uh, included in the criteria that we've seen so far. I'm not sure it should be, but um, I just can't help but note that it's not. Other thoughts? Um, Guilford and Paul, I'm interested in knowing um, what, um, what kind of outreach or who, I mean, I'm assuming you've already made a presentation of this to TAC and they, I'm sure, have some ideas about it. Um, but have you thought about what the process would be of, of finishing this up, polishing it off and, and finalizing it? Either Paul or Guilford? I did. <laughs> my, my thought is if it was, if it survives the, if it survives through and we want to uh, move it forward, that we uh, take some things and tidy it up a little bit, um, it'll probably, I mean, we're actually restricting parking. So it's sort of like um, some, some things uh, do restrict parking if you approve it. So we might have to go through the same type of hearing we do for when we set parking regulations on streets, that this is going to be accepted as the guidelines and so have some of a formal type of public hearing about it before we accept it. This is kind of what I was figuring. Mm -hmm. Evan? Yeah, so I might be, I might be getting ahead. So I like the idea, uh, first of all, let me back up actually. Um, I'm glad that we chose to hold off on making a decision on Lincoln and to engage in this conversation instead. I think this is a really useful and interesting conversation to have. Um, and I appreciate the, the work Guilford put, did um, putting this together. Uh, I found it weirdly like nerd, nerdy interesting to read through this. Um, but then it also, it also caused me to have sort of a lot of, I started opening your sheet and like doing the math and looking at like, oh, this street shouldn't have any parking on it based on some of these numbers. Um, uh, and, it, you know, especially I think it, it informs some of my thinking about some of the complaints we've got about parking on Kendrick Place. Um, for the, from the council's perspective, I guess the question becomes, um, how do we use this to inform our decision making? Um, about public ways request. And this is why I'm, I'm saying maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. So I'm thinking, does anyone know off the top of your head how, uh, how wide Lincoln is? Lincoln's about 24, 25. So 24, 25 feet, um, if we're calling it a collector road, you, you really can only have two-way traffic on it, according to this table, right? Um, yes. But if we say that we are a complete streets community um, and we want to make sure that we have safe bike lanes and we need at least four feet of bike lanes um, and it's a 25 foot road and we're putting four foot of minimum of bike lanes in, then it's 21 feet. So it's just barely big. So I guess, I guess I'm wondering, is that how we're thinking of using this of saying, well, if we want a bike lane here, uh, then maybe, uh, you know, we, we can't have any parking or, or I guess, I guess that's why I'm asking more of the committee than of Guilford, but I'd be curious to know too, is how does this intersect with complete streets? Does this say, does this mean that if a, a street is just big enough um, for uh, two cars and we want to have always have like a bike lane on an arterial or a collector road, then we can pretty much never have parking on a, on a road because the parking takes up quite a bit of space. Guilford? My answer to that would be, as you look at it for now, you would say, yes, if we want to do parking and we want to have bike lanes, then as we redevelop the road and rebuild the road, we should look at adding on, because what we're talking about here is actually pavement width, mm -hmm. but then the actual right-of-way of the road is usually much wider. 
and that's that's where the sidewalk are is and the trees and the verge and all that so there is more space that the town owns on most roads um, other than the pavement so that just means as we talk about redeveloping and moving forward these would be the roads that would get more attention and get a little widening to them to meet that complete street criteria okay thank you that's how i see it um i I'm wondering if uh, you, uh, if some of this is taken from just looking at best practices in some other towns and how they do it. This, I'm assuming you didn't just start completely from scratch, right? Just not looking at other towns or did we? I didn't, I didn't really look at other towns. What I looked at was national guidance on what people use for setting roadways. So I looked at the National Association of Transportation um, National Association of City Transportation Officials, um, MassDOT. I looked at the AASHTO standards, which is the American Association of State and Highway Transportation Officials. Um, there are other documents too we can look at. There's planning documents. The national planners have us some guidance on this. They're all about basically the same, the same numbers and so forth. And I, I kind of stuck with the national overall view right now. George? So I just want to draw our attention back to what was given to you many months ago now, back in December, um, when we, Dorothy and I made our second Lincoln parking uh, proposal. And it's what led to this um, uh, business with Guilford and, and this, this uh, memo that he's produced. And in that document, um, Dorothy and I, under item six, basically used, um, we established a set of criteria that would be applied um, when dealing with um, resident requests involving parking. And so for instance, type of street, as Guilford has shown us here, road width and traffic volume are three of the, of the criteria, but there are other criteria um, that are listed. This is obviously our work now, not Guilford's, but, um, and we, you know, we, so we turned to Guilford and, and he's given us some very specific information on type of street, road width, and traffic volume, as we've learned today, is still something that's, that's in the works and something maybe we should uh, hear some more about before we're done today briefly. But then you've got you know, accident history, public safety in terms of sufficient access for school buses, fire trucks, what's the parking demand, um, resident input, um, and complete streets, and a couple of others that were added later by uh, someone on TAC. So, um, and the, the, the final statement under six is that at least what Dorothy and I were envisioning is a set of agreed upon criteria, at least by this committee, that we would use in evaluating residential parking proposals. That was kind of the very specific goal. And the committee would examine all relevant factors and weigh them in evaluating any given request. And it would be the totality of factors and not one single factor that would be decisive. Again, this is the committee and just our attempt to begin to form our own policy. Um, any recommendation that we would make as a committee would be guided by a common set of criteria that we agreed upon and that we would employ townwide. But again, we're talking only about residential parking requests. So um, uh, it's 536. Uh, what, what, where, where do you see us getting to today, George? Excellent question. Um, one option is at some future date, um, at your discretion in terms of the agenda, um, I could return with uh, that policy somewhat uh, fancied up with Guilford's uh, contributions. Um, but there are still some things that are missing. So I think the committee perhaps needs to weigh in or at some point we need to discuss whether we need to wait um, for more specific volume information, for instance, traffic volume. Um, that's certainly going to take some time. That's not something that's going to happen overnight. Um, or do they, does the committee feel we've got enough basic information now to create a set of criteria that we can use um, and then start applying to specific cases? I'd be willing to uh, bring something back. It would be fairly similar to what you've seen before. Um, and we could have a discussion about whether we're ready to proceed with that. But this, it would be specifically related to residential parking. That's it. Whether we want to expand it beyond that would also be a possible topic for discussion. But right now, our focus, at least as I understand it, has been just on 
this committee dealing with referrals that involve residents asking questions or you know, wanting to change the parking in their residential area. So I could do that. I could present something. Um, I really need guidance from you and from the committee. How just uh, how is your um, so are you saying that you would like to have us look at, at the proposal that you and Dorothy put together as the policy that we're looking at it instead of this? Not instead of, but in terms of using this as part of the uh, criteria that we would use in evaluation. So basically what happens is, I mean, we have something that, that has been presented to us, it currently is in limbo. And what we're trying to do is come up with, as a committee, with some kind of decision about how we want to deal with it. Um, and there were three kind of basic options. And at the moment, we're exploring the option, which is TSO, um, you know, examines it and makes a decision and, or excuse me, makes a recommendation. And so the question was, what process would be used and what criteria would be used? Um, another option would be, we don't have anything to do with it at all. Um, you know, it's not TSO's job. Um, I'm not sure how that would work, but you know, um, that could be. So it wouldn't look that much different from what you saw back in December, but it would, it would have obviously more information. It would have the information that Gilbert's given us, but it would not have traffic volumes. And obviously that would be valuable if you're looking at say Lincoln or any other street, if you're dealing with Kendrick, uh, you know, Kendrick Place, there I don't think traffic volume would be an issue, but Lincoln would be, um, and we're not gonna have that information. And I don't think Guilford can provide that that quickly. Um, so the committee should, could decide, look, until we get that information with Guilford, we don't wanna go forward. I would resist that, but I'm just one person on the committee. Um, but that is information that'd be nice to have. Okay, a few. Final comments, Guilford. <laughs> um, I was just gonna say that um, I think if George and I can get together and talk through some of, um, uh, if George and I can get together, we can probably talk through some of what he had in his proposal as well. And a couple of those things actually do show up and can be accommodated in the, in the three I have. And then there's a couple of things that maybe if we wanna add another criteria to it would accommodate um, a group of those as well. So I do think that's possible to kind of blend these two together and come up with something that would meet your those needs. Does that sound good, George? Well, I think we should hear from, we have two hands up. So I, I'm gonna, you know, I'd be happy to do it, but let's hear what the others have to say. Yes. Um, Alyssa? Yeah, I think we're talking about the same thing in that I'm looking for something from, from George that's an update of what he'd worked on before with Dorothy that's well integrated with this material. And I mean integrated, meaning it could just be like like each of these lists is an appendix and then is referenced in a decision tree. Like somebody wants X, Y, Z, this already exists. And then if that's if it just doesn't meet this criteria, because you know there could be people who come to us and it's like they just didn't go to DPW first and we can say did you look at this thing did you talk to DPW and then um, then after that all those other criteria that you talked about George that we've talked about in the past including volume information that we don't have but um, accident history specific fire truck problems at specific corners that kind of thing I mean it sounds like we could pretty sounds like pretty easily George and Guilford could put you know, what we had before together with what we have now, and we can leave a space for volume and you know, traffic volume information and see if looking at that then and trying to apply it to the things we still have, I believe you said in limbo, um, if it's enough to help us figure out our next step, but try and look at that together. But it looks like we're getting pretty close. Um, Paul, do you have a comment? I do. So I think, um, one question for the for the committee is whether you're looking at making a change to parking and then have that be a global change across the town and saying now these all these roads are changing your parking or if you're going to do when a question comes to us this is a criteria we are we're applying another way to think of this might be to say do what sort of what andy did which is here's six streets tell us how this policy would apply would if you put these onto these six streets Tell us, let's walk through some of these sample things before you start talking about real streets, um, because it might be instructive to the committee to say, wow, I didn't realize we had 
we need 60 feet of pavement to accommodate all the things we want to, to accommodate. So that's just another way to think about it. Okay, um, Andy. Yeah, it's actually, it's, it's uh, following up on what Paul just said was what I was thinking about too. We have a lot of streets in town where we have allowed parking um, by our parking permit system. And I don't know if any criteria was applied in making the decision as to where to place them other than proximity to the uh, business center. And, um, but we do know that a lot of employees of various businesses, including um, employees of the town, use those permitted parking areas um, for their daytime parking. And if it was not available, that there would be no parking available for them at all. And um, at least under our, um, what we have for current infrastructure. So uh, I do think we need to be very cautious about jumping into something that has uniform applicability across town um, as opposed to uh, criteria in which to um, handle something. And I think that there's one other element to that that bothers me then as I say this, and that is that some of those streets um, create big problems, but they either don't have any residents on them or they're entirely renters. And uh, do we want to um, have a policy or practice that essentially is saying that if there are a bunch of homeowners on the street who are able to organize and uh, express their concerns that they are um, not treated in the same fashion as far as sensitivity towards their concerns about parking on the streets as opposed to um, a street that has a number of renters. And um, it's kind of that old political chestnut that comes up in lots of different areas. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we should hear from Dorothy. Um, and we have 10 minutes before the end of this meeting. So uh, let's see if we can wrap up. Dorothy? Okay, well, I just wanted to support George and his um, statement that you can take the criteria that were developed, which are very similar, but not as specific as Guilford's, working together with Guilford, come up with a unified thing but perhaps add accident history uh, and perhaps one other thing. Um, I do agree that although it sounds like really great to say this is how it's gonna be across the town, probably we should go the slower, more cautious rate and say, we now know if somebody comes to us with a request, um, in other words, if they feel there's a problem, some people may not feel there's a problem with whatever is happening on the streets right now. Um, if there's a request, this is how we can deal with it. And this is what TSO um, speaking for the town uh, or, or, or is going to put, bring forward to the whole town council, things would work. And then we could get a chance to see how it goes, right? And as Gopher said, there's a, a future aspect in this, which is some roads may get widened. Okay, so um, we could see how that goes. I do know that in terms of Lincoln, in terms of a bikeway, that's something which I gather a number of residents who've been here longer than I said that it was supposed to be a bikeway that they want it to be a bikeway and that they would like very much to have the parking situation um, clarified and to uh, allow it to be safer passage of, of cars and to have a good bikeway straight to the university. So um, I just want to kind of say let George and Guilford work it out and bring it back to you and see what you do. Thank you. Um, how would you like to summarize and wrap up, George? Well, unless I hear from the rest of you otherwise, um, Guilford and I could at some point arrange to meet and and kind of work through a set of criteria um, and to bring back to you to review. But it also sounds like listening to Paul and to Andy uh, that um, it might be nice to provide some examples like six, you know, pick six streets or whatever and show you what this policy, what impact it would have. So if we brought you some specific examples and a set of criteria, would that be sufficient for you to begin to think about um, you know, moving forward, adopting a policy? And then just very briefly, 
we live in a complaint driven system or a complaint driven world. We wouldn't be doing this if, if some people hadn't come and complained to us. Uh, I wouldn't be doing it. Um, maybe the rest of you would, but I wouldn't. So, you know, there's a limit to what you can do here. I mean, you, you, you set up a policy. That doesn't mean we're going to go and redo every street in Amherst on the basis of this policy. Uh, first of all, we couldn't afford it. Um, but uh, so there's just the issue of, of, you know, a lot of this is complaint driven. Um, and so we need to keep that in mind. But I'd be happy to meet with Guilford if he's willing and Paul's okay with it. Um, and we just uh, hammer out a common set of criteria, but we also provide you with some examples. That sounds good to me. Do we get a general nod from people that, yes, we want to do that? <laughs> okay. Um, all right, uh, so we're going to move on. I am going to um, suggest that we look at our minutes at the next meeting because um, I didn't have a chance to look at them. So I cannot tell you that they are okay, but I, I'm sure they are, but I never looked at them. So <laughs> um, I think I'm just going to put them on our agenda for our April 8th meeting, if that, if, unless people are upset about that. Um, okay, any announcements? Um, the next meeting agenda items, we know that on March 27th, on Saturday, we're going to have a, uh, another public forum. We're having a public forum at six o'clock today. We're gonna to have one at 2 p.m. on March 27th on the um, Pomeroy Village intersection proposal. Um, and, and then our following two meetings are on April 8th and April 22nd. And at present, we have nothing planned other than our discussions of the Pomeroy Village intersection. So um, there may be something coming, but we don't know what, know at the moment what it would be. Um, and if some people on this committee have ideas about what they want to put forward that's been on our back burner, um, just let me know, please. Um, so do we have, we do have, um, we might have some public here. Uh, does anybody have any comments about our upcoming agendas? No, oh, okay. Um, and I am assuming that we have a, we're going to have to adjourn this and come back to another meeting. Is that correct? No? We don't need to adjourn anything. We can just transition to the other. That's fine. There's but, only one link and this is it, is my understanding. Yeah, uh, we only have one link. That just caused problems for people who might already be connecting. All right, let's see. Um, we have some attendees. Um, Okay, so uh, we're at the part of the first meeting uh, where we can have public comment. We have three people here. If you are here to make public comment um, uh, in the meeting with regard to Pomeroy Village uh, intersection proposal, then this is not the time to make that public comment. That will be after six o'clock. Um, but if anyone, who is on is here for public comment with regard to anything other than that, um, uh, you could make that now um, by simply raising your hand. And I don't see any raised hands. So could we just have a recess for about five, six minutes? Um, yes, yes, that's fine. So. Uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Evan. Evan? I was muted. Uh, I'm not sure if we've talked about this. I know we had switched to the five to seven meeting time to accommodate um, JCPC, which I believe has either zero more meetings or one more meeting, I think. Um, and so one more meeting. And so, uh, which I believe is before our next meeting. Um, so I didn't know, are we planning on sticking to five to seven? Do we want to go back to our, uh, what we are 630 to 830? Good question. Um, yeah, our, our, currently we're scheduled to go back for the April 22nd meeting. Um, but do people, 
have a preference? Would you rather keep it the way it is um, or go back to the 7 p.m.? I'm assuming that we wanted to go back to 7 p.m., but 6 p.m., 7 p.m.? We, we were doing 6.30 to 8.30 before. Oh, that's true. Yeah. I, I will say I've actually preferred the 5 to 7, but I'm open. But we can also. Yeah, I, I kind of would like to go back to 6.30 because I it conflicts with another meeting that I have, um, which I just haven't gone to. Um, but other other people? I have a preference for what we've been doing, but I'm again, I'm flexible, but uh, the five to seven, um, I don't know how it impacts on staff, but I, I could go either way, but. Um... Alyssa? My problem is I like five to seven, but I'm not sure it's very appropriate for the community, but quite honestly, I don't think most town council meetings are at appropriate times for the community. And since we're doing them by Zoom, I think that's different than when we were doing them in person and expecting people to drive to town hall at what I consider to be odd times of day for town count, various town council committee meetings. So I appreciate Darcy that it's a conflict for you. It's also a conflict for me a couple of times a month um, to do five o'clock, but it works well in my schedule to do five to seven. So um, I don't know. Or if six would somehow be some sort of compromise that would help people. I definitely don't want to start as late as seven, even though that is a more traditional town time, but you know, it's a different time period. It's 2021 and we've had a pandemic. Is there any way we can stick with five for a few more months and see if that's still working for people? Yeah, it's tight for me because I actually provide daycare for my grandson on Tuesdays and Thursdays. He, you know, like it's kind of, he, he leaves at five. And so that's extremely tight. Um, not impossible. Obviously I've done it, you know, but it means, you know, well, anyway, it's, it's harder. Um, but, um, and I would like to be able to go to that other meeting. So I, I would prefer 630, but it looks like we got, Andy, you might be the, the deciding vote here. Or no, I think we already have three in favor of five o'clock. Um, I'm willing to accommodate either. I appreciated that um, people um, adjusted so that I could serve on JCPC and attend those meetings. And so I, I thank all of you for that. Um, and I understand Darcy's desire to be at her other meeting, whatever it is. Um, so I kind of leave it aside and not vote uh, and just accommodate whatever the group decides. Well, I think traditionally we try to accommodate everyone if we can, and it seems like we, you know, the rest of us can accommodate you, Darcy. So um, I'm willing to go back to the 6:30. Um, that allows you to take care of your child care and allows you to attend a meeting that you commonly attend. So uh, unless a colleague has a conflict between 6:30 and 8:30, sounds like we should go back to it. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, all right. So we have. You want to take three minutes? and come back. Okay, so you can turn off your videos or whatever, come back at six o'clock, sharp.
Or say, I love your story about the missing four. Yeah, I know, I know. It would be a great subject of a novel or something. Yeah, it's it's been a challenge for me for months now. <laughs> and the fact you spell out four. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I did finally realize that I could copy and paste it pretty easily. <laughs> There's certain things that you can't copy it and paste it into though, which I will not go into now. But um, okay, I think we're, are we all back? Six. Just open up your videos, you're back. Oh. And I forgot to adjourn the last meeting, FYI. I declare it adjourned now. I got 557, I think. <laughs> Oh, okay, good. Popped. <laughs> good. We, uh, it was a de facto adjourned. Um, Not attending. I was saying, Darcy, I enjoyed attending as an attendee the TSO meeting. I think you had a very effective meeting. Thank you. Thank you. You could have shown your face. Well, I think it was confusing um, because I was really just an attendee. I think maybe Athena thought I was still on the committee. So uh -huh. I, I just didn't, I didn't want to, you know, do anything I shouldn't do. But I think we're we're on air now, right? So um, I think that we can get started. Um, I'm going to start the meeting now. Is everybody all set? Um, good evening. I'm Darcy Dumont, chair of the Town Services and Outreach Committee. Uh, seeing that there's a quorum in attendance, I'm calling the March uh, 25th, 2021 meeting of the Town Service and Outreach Committee to order at 6.02. Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law allow us to hold this virtual meeting of the Town Services and Outreach Committee. I'm going to call on each committee member by name to confirm that you can hear me and we can hear you. And I did not mention that's also a meeting of the whole council. Alyssa Brewer. Not back yet. Darcy Dumont here. Evan Ross. Here. George Ryan. Here. Andy Steinberg. Here. Now the council president, um, Lynn Griesmer is going to check on the remaining members of the council. Seeing that we have a quorum of the council, I'm going to call the council meeting to order as well at 6.02. And I'm going to check for those people who are councillors but not members of TSO. Steve Schreiber. Here. Um, Sarah Schwartz. Here. Pat DeAngelis. Here. Shalini Balmilne. Yes. Dorothy Pam. Here. And I, did I get everybody? I think so. Thank you. And Alyssa, are you here? Not yet. Um, those assisting the meeting will be monitoring committee members' connections, and if necessary, we'll pause the meeting until we're reconnected. Uh, this Zoom meeting will be posted on the Town of Amherst YouTube channel. So um, the agenda for this meeting is um, simply the public forum on the Pomeroy Village intersection. Um, we have a separate agenda format that we are going to follow that's in the packet. Um, and the, the first 15 minutes will be um, a couple of short presentations uh, Chris Brestrup, the director of planning, is going to be providing a slide presentation and we're going to have a couple of little openers with me and Paul. But then the remaining part of the meeting is 45 minutes of public comment. So 
that's when the public comment will come in. Um, I am, like I said, the chair of the Town Services and Outreach Committee. Uh, we were referred the issue of the Pomeroy Village intersection, uh, mainly uh, just the issue of roundabout versus whether it's going to be a signalized intersection. Um, uh, we are hoping to hear about from residents tonight, um, basically your highest priorities um, from the users of the village center. Um, since the town council is responsible for making the decision about the work to be done, we need to hear from people um, what they are thinking. So I am just gonna pass this on to the town manager who's going to tell us a little bit about the purpose and outline of this meeting. Thank you, Darcy. So um, uh, I'm Paul Bockelman, I'm town manager. I'm joined here by the assistant town manager, Dave Zomack, our planning director, Chris Brestrup, and our superintendent of public works, Guilford Mooring. So this is an exciting day for us because we are taking on a beginning the process of a very uh, important project that's been on the drawing boards or, or on the to-do list for a very long time. And we will get very briefly the history in, uh, of this project uh, in the presentation. Um, we are, uh, this is the first, one of the first steps in our outreach efforts to the community. We have other outreach efforts. We had a call-in show uh, this afternoon at noon uh, with the the town engineer and with the superintendent of public works where people are able to just have in, informal questions and answers. We will have another forum, but twice as long on Saturday at two o'clock. So if you uh, have questions that don't get answered or you think of questions in the, in, overnight, you can come back at two o'clock on Saturday and engage again with the same type of uh, presentation. Uh, we will be having um, other opportunities for people to engage. We will have a um, pop-up tent uh, it's, um, we haven't chosen it. it'll be a Saturday, April 3rd or April 17th, I think are the two Saturdays where we'll just be out in the field um, uh, wel welcoming people um, and informally, socially distanced and talk answering your questions one on one in person. We also have um, We'll be reaching out individually to all the property owners, every property owner that will be affected. You'll have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the planning director and the assistant town manager. We'll reach out to you individually so we can hear your concerns that you might not want to express in public, but might want to convey to us individually. And lastly, we have a very interesting new platform called Engage Amherst, which you can get to by either through our website, the main website, the amherstma.gov website, or uh, at engageamherst.org. And that uh, website has received a lot of um, uh, interaction already. Um, you know, about 80 people have already interacted, there are 80 different interactions with it, where you can pose questions, you can, and our, our staff will answer them uh, in live, and it, and, it, and it keeps that information out there. So tonight, it's about listening to you, not to me, um, and we'll um, do a, about a 10 or 12 minute presentation to you, which is a smaller presentation than we did to the council initially, and then uh, the bulk of the time will be um, spent uh, answering questions, uh, listening to feedback. Uh, we're trying to have this be a structured conversation. So we, ha we have some prompts for you. Um, we're not interested, we're not that interested in, in saying, do you want this or that? We wanna know how you use the, um, the, the village center and what it means to you and how, what considerations the council should take uh, when it is making its decision. So, um, a couple of weeks ago, we had the Secretary of Housing and Economic Development uh, walking through the area because they had get, they were the ones that gave the town um, a $1.5 million grant to take on this project. And while $1.5 million sounds like a lot of money, and it is, um, when you're in public construction, it actually is really probably focused just on the, the intersection. So that's really where we're, um, we're focusing our efforts. But we see this as a catalyst for additional growth and uh, connection for people and to solve some of the problems that many of you have had um, over the years. And we'd like to hear more about what those issues are that you would like to see addressed. So with that, um, I'm gonna turn it over to um, Chris Brestrup and I'm gonna share my screen if I'm able to do that.
Chris. Good evening. Um, my name is Chris Brestrup and I'm the Amherst Planning Director. Welcome to our meeting at which we hope to uh, hear from you about what you would like to see in the Pomeroy Village intersection. Slide. Um, this is a meeting of the Town Services and Outreach Committee of the Town Council. And Town Council members will also be listening to your ideas, questions, comments, and concerns. Town Services and Outreach Committee members are here to listen with Darcy Dumont as their chair. Town Council members are here to listen with Lynn Griesmer as their chair, as their president, excuse me. Town staff is also here, including the Department of Public Works, the Planning Department, the Town Manager, and the Assistant Town Manager. Next slide, please. Um, so what are we going to do today, tonight? Uh, we're going to explain why this project is coming up now, provide a brief background on the Pomeroy Village intersection, and then ask you for your comments. And we want to hear from you about um, your questions, concerns, and comments on how we can make this intersection uh, a better place to be. We have someone taking notes tonight. Next slide, please. So uh, Pomeroy Village intersection lies in South Amherst. It's at the intersection of Pomeroy Lane, uh, West Pomeroy Lane and Route 116 or West Street. It has a mix of single family home uh, neighborhoods and apartments and condos, businesses, offices, and schools. It's a high traffic intersection, especially during rush hours. Next slide, please. So what are the types of challenges that this intersection has? It's very car oriented. It lacks safe pedestrian access. It lacks proper sidewalks and curb ramps mm. and crosswalks. Mm. It lacks bike lanes and the existing traffic signals don't have pedestrian operated signals to allow pedestrians mm. to cross. There's also a problem of cars queuing in the afternoon, particularly southbound, as people come to pick up children at the Montessori school and all about learning and as people leave Amherst to drive home to their homes in South Hadley and Granby and Point South. Next slide, please. So as, as Paul said, the town received, the town applied for and received a grant of $1.5 million from the Mass Works Program of the state. Um, the improvements that we hope to accomplish will focus on traffic safety and efficiency pedestrian and bicycle safety, and will provide well-designed bus stops for transit riders. The project is a collaboration between the Department of Public Works and the Planning Department mm -hmm. with review and approval by the Town Council, which has jurisdiction over the public ways. Next slide, please. So the history of this project goes back to the 1990s when the state wanted to widen the roads and improve the intersection but they wanted to do it in, the, in a way that the residents of Amherst did not feel was appropriate. So the town asked the state to take over the road so we could make our own decisions about the roadway and the intersection. In the early 2000s, the town installed traffic signals, but these were meant as placeholders until the intersection improvements could be designed. Then the DPW and the planning department with the assistance of the design review board developed a design for the intersection with lots of public input, including meetings and surveys, but there wasn't any money to build the improvements. In 2013, we applied for a Mass Works grant, but at that time we were not successful. But last year, in 2020, we applied again and we were successful this time. Next slide, please. So why are we here today? The TSO, or Town Services and Outreach Committee of the Town Council, is seeking input from the public to help them decide what type of intersection to develop. The Town Council needs to make a decision by June as to whether to develop an enhanced, signalized intersection or to develop a roundabout. So we'd like to tell you a bit about these two types of intersections. Here you have an image of the typical signalized intersection. A signalized intersection is controlled or regulated by traffic signals or road signs. And this is a type of intersection that we're most familiar with. Next slide, please. A roundabout is a circular intersection 
where drivers travel counterclockwise around a center island. Generally, there are no traffic signals or stop signs in a roundabout. Drivers yield as they approach the roundabout, then they enter the roundabout intersection and they exit at their desired street. This type of intersection is becoming more popular and more common here in the United States and elsewhere. Next slide, please. So what kinds of uh, things do we wanna hear from you? Um, we'd like to know what role you play in this intersection. Are you a business owner? Do you live nearby? Do you shop here? Or do you mainly travel through the intersection? And if you do travel through the intersection, how do you do that? Do you travel on bike? Do you drive, walk, or ride the bus? What improvements would you like to see in Pomeroy Village? What features are most important to you in the redesigned Pomeroy Village intersection? And how can we make this area more welcoming? How can we help to support the businesses in the Village Center? There are, next slide, please. There are many opportunities for public input. Town staff will be contacting abut abutting property owners and meeting with business operators. We'll be contacting people who live in the area. There's also an interactive website, as Paul said, at www.engageamers.org. The town council will be holding committee meetings. Tonight, they're hosting the first of two open public meetings, and they'll be soliciting written comments as well. Um, so now we'd like to hear from you about your ideas, questions, and concerns about this project. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Um, Okay, so we are going to move on to the part of the meeting that's public comment. Um, and um, we're going to limit people's public, well, we're going to take a look and see how many people would like to give public comment. Uh, to do so, you need to raise your hand. So if we can get an idea how many people want to give a public comment, that would be great. Um, and, um, so in view of the fact that your, your time is going to be limited, um, we do want you to try to answer the questions that Chris just mentioned. Um, uh, if you could share them first, uh, depending on what your other questions and comments were that you came with, just take, just um, keep in mind that the time is limited. So if you came with a special question or comment, just make sure you have enough time to ask it. Um, so um, the first, I'm just gonna run through those questions again that Chris uh, mentioned that we'd like you to, to introduce yourself with. Um, how do you primarily relate to Pomeroy Village Center um, as a resident, business owner, commercial property owner, business customer, church or school patron? There, here are our questions. Maybe we should just leave them up there so that people can, can look at them. I think that's a good idea. Um, so we'll, rather than me reading through them, we'll leave them up here. So we'd like you to answer them, um, but just make sure you leave enough time to, to uh, be able to ask the question that you came to ask. Um, it looks like there aren't a huge number of, um, yep, five people so far. So why don't we limit people to uh, three minutes. If you have a question, it probably won't end up being three minutes anyway. So, um, Adrian. And we were going to show people's faces, right? Um, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. TSO and um, town councilors and town staff. Um, my name is Adrian Terizzi, and I am a resident of Orchard Valley, uh, one of the original owners of the uh, homes here on a 200 uh, household area that we have a pride and joy of being very racially and ethnically diverse. Now, I would like to answer some of the questions as quickly as possible. South Amherst, Pomeroy Village, I am the biggest cheerleader for it. I've been waiting for a long time for us to get to this point. So hats off to David Zomek and everyone who got the grant going for us. Um, 
Oops, the questions dis disappeared. So let me just say that with the Groff Park rehabilitation and my um, my joy down here in Orchard Valley is the reawakened and the refurbished Markets Pond Recreation Area, the new paths that take our East Hadley people to Groff Park and all of the exciting new developments, I see Pomeroy Village as a crown jewel. I can't see the questions, Dorothy, so if you could put those up, I'd be happy to answer them. Could we put them back up? Mm -hmm. So what would I like to see? Um, as everyone else, and I've already gone into the engaged Amherst, we are a diverse neighborhood in South Amherst. Precinct 7 and 8 bring together a whole host of diversity, both in income level, social, ethnic, and cultural values. But I do think, and I think Shalini and Darcy would agree, we are a vibrant group of residents that want to see Pomeroy Village work for everyone. So what would, how I primarily travel? By bike, by walking, mostly by car. The improvements I'd like to see, I would like walkways and more bikeways and benches to sit and places to congregate for everyone who goes up there. Oops, the questions just left me again. Mm, sorry. <laughs> I, need, I need the help so I can scoot by these. <laughs> My computer's funky, so I'm sorry. Um, so <laughs> I lost track of the questions. I don't want to go over my time, but regard whether it we're talking about a rotary or an intersection, I can't weigh in there yet because I haven't really studied uh, plans that I assume will be forthcoming. So I'd like to hold my opinion on that, um, other than to say thrilled that this is uh we've got that 2020 grant and um i'll be listening to more developments as they come along thank you so much i appreciate your time i'll i'll mute myself now thank you adrian um could we can we get that back up paul i'm working on it my computer's very slow right now i'm sorry oh hmm. i just think that's so important for people to be able to see it yeah it'll take a second Um, okay, we'll just wait. And, and Lynn, I, I forgot to ask you if you're do, be, you're being the timer. I'm trying to do, I'm trying to be both the IT person and the timer. And I've already messed up once. <laughs> you see Adrian's little box, but at least got to speak. So just have um, patience and I'll do my very best. Paul and I, I think we would not be the exemplars of IT tonight. <laughs> I'm getting there. Okay, great. Catherine Bell. Hi, thank you so much for taking my uh, questions and comments. Um, I uh, am a business owner. Um, I own Thistlebloom Farm. Um, and, uh, and I live in South Amherst, obviously, and I have lived in this area of South Amherst and East Headley Road for most of my life. Um, but I grew up in England, so I have comments about roundabouts. Um, and, um, uh, and I would like to be able to use, uh, to, to, to use more of the businesses in, in uh, Pomeroy Village, uh, more easily. Um, than I currently can. Most of the time I travel by car because it is very difficult uh, to walk there from where I live, which is on Southeast Street. Um, uh, so sidewalks to that area would be uh, from, from there somehow. Somebody made, made comment about this on the um, Engage Amherst site. Um, and I think it's a brilliant idea. Um, that would Those would be extremely helpful if those sidewalks didn't cut off because I don't feel safe walking on, um, uh, on Pomeroy uh, after a certain point. Um, I do think that we have the opportunity here to make a really lovely village center, a true village center, as several people have mentioned on that site. Um, and right now, um, there is an issue, of course, with many people just driving through and trying to do so very fast. 
I think a roundabout would probably exacerbate rather than solve that problem. And uh, my comment specifically about roundabout, my concerns about it, um, uh, would be that it would tend to speed up uh, traffic and it might be too small. Uh, the smaller a roundabout is after a certain point, the more dangerous it is. And if we want to encourage foot traffic and people stopping in at businesses and patronizing them more, which I think is a real, a real thing that a lot of us would like to do, um, it, it, I would, I think personally that a controlled um, uh, intersection, the, you know, as as you showed at the beginning, would would serve those purposes better. Um, frankly, um, and I think that it would also help to make the place more welcoming because I think it would have a more of a traffic calming effect than a roundabout does, which I think is a traffic uncalming effect. Um, uh, uh, you know, if people are, are just sort of using the road simply to get home. So um, I think that would serve the, um, the, the businesses better and would certainly uh, be a much nicer place to do things like put up shade trees and benches and, um, and we need more bike lanes and, you know, si and sidewalks and all that sort of stuff that would help, I think, to, uh, to improve the overall function. And I've probably gabbed over my time and I apologize for doing so. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Catherine. And uh, so now we'll hear from Claire. Hi, thank you, Darcy. This is Claire Bertrand. I live in South Amherst. I have lived um, at that intersection um, for about 10 years. I now live out on Bay Road where we raised our family. Um, so I have a business um, concern because I manage the office park. The Amherst office park is seven office buildings where people um, use the intersection both to get to work, of course, post pandemic. Um, and they also like to go get coffee and lunch and amenities in the area. And so my number one uh, concern would be safety. Um, not just at the, the, what is the light, but also, you know, hundreds of feet before and after so that people can cross the road comfortably. And so um, back in, I think it was the 2008 design, um, the, it, was, it was an excellent design. It was previous to the idea of roundabouts, but there was some excellent traffic calming built into that. And I would value if there is uh, the possibility of bringing this whole street, not just this cross section, but area um, that fills that village center, if that all could be addressed. Traffic calming would slow people down, which I think we know would be valuable for people crossing the roads, but also allow folks to see what we have in South Amherst. We have lots going on. Uh, we have lots of schools from, you know, the Montessori and, and we have Hampshire Gymnastics School. We have yoga, we have all kinds of cool things, um, but people go through often so fast that they don't ever see, um, I'm often told, Oh, I didn't know you were here. <laughs> um, I want to thank the uh, obviously Dave and Christine and all that helped get this grant. I want to thank you. I know how hard these are to get, and it's a huge boon if this can um, be done and be done well. I'd love it to be done sooner than you have in your timeline, but it's going to be a huge enhancement, um, both in safety and in a sense of community in our area. The one question I, I would appreciate help with, again, I don't care, frankly, if it's a, an in, a lighted intersection or a roundabout, unless there's a lot of land that would be taken one versus the other. Um, I guess that would be my only question is, does the land use change if we do a roundabout instead of just a lighted intersection? Thank you. Could could we, um, could maybe Christine or Dave? Thank Guilford. Or Guilford. Mm -hmm. 
There's gopher here. Oh, there's gopher. At, at this time, it's hard to tell which which is going to take the most land. If the traffic analysis says we need turn lanes on Pomeroy or West Pomeroy, we would actually probably need more land than a roundabout. If we just need turn lanes on West Street, we may be, it may be um, that we can stay within the footprint of the roadway. We probably will take some pieces of the corners um, on all four corners for sidewalks. Um, but that's, we know we're gonna definitely do that. So that's where we are right now. We don't have any more detailed information. Thank you. Uh, Noah Loving. Hello, uh, I'm Noah Loving. I'm on uh, Seven Coach. So uh, it's uh, the intersection that I go through a lot uh, going on walks, driving. Um, I would like to be shopping more in that area in terms of, you know, it's, it's great access to a lot of great restaurants and stuff. The lack of uh, general ability to control traffic in terms of having signs or anything or side flashers or anything pedestrian friendly kind of hurts that. So any improvements in that sphere in terms of having um, the kind of side flashers that exist on university campuses or something like that, those are great or just a general um, pedestrian controlled signal. Um, I've definitely experienced the, the backup that can happen at certain points in the day and certain times during the week when it comes to taking a few cycles to get through the light. Um, generally, I know that's not a big issue most of the times that I'm driving, but I've definitely experienced it. So I imagine anything we do roundabout or enhanced signaling as it was called before will improve traffic flow. Um, I guess my inclination would be towards roundabout, but it really is gonna depend on what the actual proposals are and how much of a difference it would be expected to make um, and how and how easy it is to implement the the walkability, as I would kind of put that as a higher priority over improving flow at this point. Um, there was a, some mention of bike lanes. I would love to have bike lanes there, but given that the project is not currently talking about expanding too much outside of the intersection in any direction, and there is not a lot of bike lanes in that area, I'm wondering how that would connect or whether it would just be protection for bikes coming into that intersection. Um, let's see, the idea of having areas to congregate sounds really nice. Um, I hadn't thought about that before, but you know, if that's in the cards without, again, encroaching too much in the, on the surrounding businesses, that would be great. But it's a, a lot of this stuff kind of makes me wonder exactly what we're gonna see in terms of specific proposals. So uh, I think that's all I have to offer, but any improvement would be great. I've been hearing about this since I was a, a little kid, the idea that we might have some improvement here. So we will, we will see exactly <laughs> what happens. I'm very appreciative for everyone for uh, making it happen last year and uh, allowing uh, as much public public comment as there's been to think about how we can make it work best. Thank you very much. Uh, Jeannie. Hello, good evening. This is Ginny Hamilton. I'm sitting here at dinner with my spouse and child um, who are all excited to be hearing about this. We live on Middle Street, so just a mile from this intersection. And um, back when we drove places, we regularly drove through this intersection at least once a day. Um, and in good weather, we bike through it at least once a week. Uh, so highest priority on um, our end is around safety, um, improving the intersection for walkable, spikeable safety. Um, we've got a kid who's at Crocker for only a couple more months, uh, so biking to school won't be the option for him through this intersection, but um, we have not been willing to, to do that on his own because of the problems with this intersection. Um, so I love the ideas that people are sharing about the enhanced um, and signaled intersection. Um, I think that's key. Um, I do hope that there'll be more space for, for biking and for pedestrian access and connecting to whatever 
we end up doing at the Hickory Ridge property. I mean, that's uh, an opportunity that, uh, you know, having that that connection with the bikeway or a multi-use path would be fabulous. Um, I am um, strongly favor, at least at this point, strongly favor the enhanced signaled intersection over a rotary. And that's based on our interaction going down to the rotaries by Atkins. And yes, the traffic pattern is very different there. But biking with a child through those rotaries um, is um, not comfortable, and it's not something that I'm willing to let my child do on their own yet. Um, whereas a traffic light uh, where there's clear signals and people are expecting to stop uh, feels far more safe. So in that way, from the safe, safety standpoint, um, the signaled intersection feels far safer as a previous commenter said you know people are supposed to slow down and yield um i don't see that they necessarily do and uh signals t tend to help that at least in my experience as a parent so um i echo uh the thanks for the people who've been working on this for a long time um hopefully my child will see this while it's still during his childhood unlike the previous speaker um, and in terms of welcoming, the one other thing that I would say is, yes, I love the ideas of places to congregate and, and hopefully some, um, the welcoming atmosphere that would allow daytime businesses. I mean, we go in the evenings for dinner or drinks, but um, a cafe, a place to, to hang out and congregate, I know you all aren't in charge of the businesses, but having that sort of walkable place where we could walk up to get a cup of coffee and meet a friend um, would be lovely to have a mile from home. Um, so I will uh, uh, finish my comments there and thank you all for this process and particularly to Dave and others who've been working on this for a long, long time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Erica. Hi, thanks. Um, my name is Erica Zikas and I'm a South Amherst resident. Um, I would say that I move through this intersection primarily by car and occasionally by bike. Um, and I come here to eat, shout out to El Comolito. Um, so it's it mostly as a, as a, as a retail um, participant. And um, the improvements that I'd like to see are, I guess I echo my neighbors in saying that I'd like to see um, increased safety. Um, I am leaning towards a roundabout because I think that it's irrefutable that it's safer for cars. What I'd like to see is um, data and information about whether it is in fact safer for pedestrians and cyclists because I feel like I can't find reliable information um, about that and suspect that somebody's done a study that could be shared with the community on that. Um, I also have to say that, you know, I'm very concerned with the environment and I know that in South Amherst we have two counselors who really champion the environment and I know that roundabouts will be um, better for the uh, environment because it reduces the amount of idling um, that happens there. Um, I think that this area has kind of a a motley aesthetic and that's largely because there's just so much parking at the street and the the buildings are pushed back quite far and I think that that could be unified with some bands or zones of tree plantings. Um, I'd love also to see sheltered bus stops on both sides of the street for our neighbors who use the bus to get around. I think that that would be a real gift um, and like everyone else I think you know improved sidewalks that extend beyond the, the limits of the intersection, um, but uh, down uh, Pomeroy Lane um, would be fantastic. I, I hope that the design is anticipating future development at Hickory Ridge. Um, and I think beyond that, I just, I don't need to restate what everybody else has said. I think it's a great project and I'm glad for so many opportunities for the public to weigh in. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Um, Mary Hoyer. Hello. Hey, Mary. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. 
Um, I, I live up in uh, Amherst Woods and mostly um, we drive through the intersection rather than biking or walking. Um, but we do use the businesses there. Uh, we do use uh, the Mexican restaurant and the Guatemalan restaurant. And of course the um, gas station, you know, before the pandemic virtually shut down all driving. Um, I would, I have a preference for a roundabout for environmental reasons and would like to, but I do understand that safety is paramount. Um, I'd like to observe that if you look at the two diagrams, the one with the rectangular crosswalks and the one with the roundabout crosswalks, the crosswalks for the roundabout are actually shorter. The time that pedestrians would spend on, in the crosswalk would be less time than it would be on the rectangular uh, signal um, area. Uh, and this is something that came up down in Hartford, Connecticut, when I was working on a similar project and roundabouts were introduced down there that in fact, for disabled people, and they certainly should be consulted on this, um, you can get from one side of the exit ramp to the to a central area and stop and then go to the other side and and it and it is a shorter distance. Um, so I'd like to observe that. Um, I, I would like to say, I, one other person mentioned, and I'd like to emphasize the fact that landscaping can almost correct any horrific design problem. Although if you took land that's currently devoted to parking in front of the buildings, like over where the dry cleaner is, and turned it into a plaza with landscaping and some benches or chairs, and if there were a cafe there, and put more of the parking in back where it's not an eyesore, um, that that could improve things considerably. So I think um, landscape design would make a huge difference. Um, and I think that's about it. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth Davis. He needs to unmute. Can you un unmute Elizabeth? Yes, thank you. I'm sorry. Elizabeth Davis, I live on Bay Road. Thank you for having these public meetings by virtually uh, so that people who can't get out easily can, can attend and, and find out what's going on. I generally support um, the roundabout concept because I know how well it works for the Atkins um, traffic uh, situation. Like other speakers, I have concern about the crosswalks. There is only one crosswalk at the Atkins uh, turn uh, and I had a very uh, near escape trying to cross there with a traffic car that was going southbound on 116 and going on to west. So how the uh, crosswalks at Pomeroy Center could work, I don't know, but that would be my, my main, uh, my concern. And thank you for having this hearing virtually. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public that want to make a comment? Um, doesn't look like we have any other comments. We'll wait another couple seconds and see if anybody raises his or her hand. There is there is one. I think Richard Koffler. Oh, he's not. He hasn't arisen to the top of the list. Oh, there we go, Richard. Richard. Yes, I'm Rosemary Koffler, and I live in South Amherst. Do you, are you able to hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, near Atkins. And I primarily go through the intersection 
by car pre-COVID. I would take the bus frequently, but um, I do feel the biggest issue is safety for pedestrians. I'd like to see the opportunity for people from the neighborhood to be able to walk more in that area. I am concerned about the fact that roundabout is less safe for pedestrians, perhaps. I don't know that for sure by studies, but if uh, we were to have the regular intersection, I would like to see an intersection where a pedestrian can push a walk button and get the mm -hmm. traffic to stop and maybe lights come on as they do on Bay Road in front of Applewood. Um, I also would really like to see more, I thought Mary Hoyer's idea for parking behind some of those shops and having landscaping and sitting areas in front of the shops is very appealing. And um, people would like to stop at those areas if it were more eye appealing. I also feel for safety that there should be a bike lane or a good sidewalk between the village center and Crocker Farm School. And there should be bus stops with shelters and benches yeah. for people to sit at. Thank you and thank you very much for having this opportunity to speak and for presenting this information. Thank you, Rosemary. Is there anyone else on the list who would like to make a comment? I just want to point out that there's 38 participants tonight uh, and a total of 21 attendees and 17 on the panelists. Good turnout. Um, I think that if there are no more public comments, um, Paul, uh, Dave, would you like to comment? Yeah, if I could, just for one one moment, I know you want to, I, I believe you're going to open this up for, for TSO members and council members, but um, I just wanted to acknowledge the shout outs earlier. Uh, you can see me smiling on the Zoom, but, um, uh, you know, you see Guilford, Chris, and, and and I on many of these calls, and and I think we make a great collaborative team, you know, representing planning and, and working with Paul and, and the DPW. But truthfully, um, you know, and we're really excited about this grant. It's not every day you get a $1.5 million grant, and it's been a while since we, we got the last one, and I remember that. But truthfully, uh, the three of us have very talented, creative teams behind us. And they do a lot of great work and we're only as good as they are. So, you know, people like Jason Skeels and Paul Deffier in the engineering department, Nate Malloy and Ben Brager in the planning department, um, they make the three of us, I think, look good every day. So I just wanted to acknowledge that it's more than just the three of us. There is great staff and they work for us to support Paul and the council, but they also work for everybody, of course, in the town of Amherst. So, uh, thank you for the acknowledgments, but uh, we're a team and uh, we, we, we think we're on, uh, we're on a roll. We've gotten a lot of grants lately and we want that, that momentum to continue. So just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dave. Um, Paul had a, a few comments that he wanted to make about next steps also. Yes. Yeah, so again, um... We wanted here. This is this is really great. People had really terrific comments. I've got multiple pages of notes here, and I know Chris was taking notes as well. Um, so we would like to hear from more people and ask you to share this link um, out for Saturday at two p.m. The meeting uh, we will have then. This is another opportunity. It will look sort of the same, uh, but there'll be more time for to listen to people and to have comments about it. So that's a really good thing. Uh, and also the Engage Amherst, several people commented on that, which I was really thrilled by. And we put a lot of work into to it. This is one of our first really um, engagement through that process. And this one really has generated a lot of support. So take a minute, look at it. It's, it's where we will capture and uh, put all the information. So it's an it's a easy place to find information for you as well. 
Um, and then this will keep running through. Ultimately, the process is the TSO committee, uh, which is the committee that's meeting here. It's a, it's a subcommittee of basically of the town council will make a recommendation to the full town council. The town council, uh, we're hoping that they will be able to make a decision by the end of June, which lets us go through the um, procurement, the, the design, schematic design process. I know we'd like to do this faster, but it, the, doing the design carefully and then also going out to bid and uh, al aligning our work with construction seasons. Million said it won't happen in 2021, but it will happen in 2022. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to mention also that TSO is going to be looking at this at their April 8th and 22nd um, meetings. And if for some reason you don't, uh, if you know someone who wants to make a public comment that it can always be done at our meetings also, um, in addition to the public forum on Saturday. Um, Alyssa? Thank you so much. Ironically, what I wanna bring up is that I, in contrast to something that was said earlier, I don't believe this is a time for town councilors to speak. And I don't think that Saturday is either. I think we all came here with the intention of listening. My question is simply um, based on the next steps. It's my understanding and I agree with this list, but I just wanna double check that we don't need to have a public hearing on the intersection design. We just will have, we have these various public forums, lots of individual outreach, lots of TSO meetings, recommendations to council, public town council meetings, but we don't have an actual quote hearing with a capital H, correct? Uh, I, Paul, we would only have to have a hearing if we were amending some kind of bylaw uh, that would be setting parking regulations or we have to have a public forum when we're spending money. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I would agree with Alyssa that, that uh, I, I don't think there was an intention to have a discussion with the council to, tonight. So I think that we're actually done. <laughs> Uh, until tomorrow, or until Saturday at 2 p.m. And I, um, I would um, agree with Paul that to the extent that people can tell your the other um, networks, all your networks, your neighbors and friends, um, to come out to the hearing on Saturday to give opinions. One thing that I don't see here tonight is business owners. Um, so to the extent that we can get the word out to them, I'm sure that some of the business owners would like to weigh in. So um, unless we have any further comments, I believe that I'm going to declare us adjourned. And would you like to do the same, Lynn? Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, the meeting of the council is adjourned at 6.52. Okay, see you all, uh, you all on Saturday. Thank you, staff. <laughs>